evolves into another character. This is another colorful one where we have Osiris, who is the god of the underworld, very, very prominent in Egyptian culture. He sits on the throne of Isis. He does not rule in his own stead, which is a common mistake folks make in uh, seeing uh, Egyptian religion portrayed. And then I'd like to just have this one, which is another one. This is a goddess on the left, not, who has a feather on top of her head. And that feather is actually put on the scales. You've seen the scales of justice in the underworld. There are scales where the human heart is measured. Will I go to heaven? Will I go to hell? And that feather represents justice, divine justice. And Matt is worshiping, now this is Isis in one of her other aspects, where she has the horned uh, globe, which represents the moon. And this comes from basically the women's menstrual cycles, put them in tune with the universe. There was even a, a couple of stories saying that at one point the moon was actually closer to the earth than it is now. And as a result of being closer, there were 13 months of the moon cycles, not 12 as we know. Okay. So if you think about that for a second, how 13 became such an unlucky number, as part of it is tied to that. Now we have uh, one of the only pharaohs that we know of, Hapshit Sut, who was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. And that dynasty lasted from 1500 to 1300 BC. So as we see now, we're getting closer. We're getting closer to the, what we call the classical age, when writing and culture and uh, trade and all these things were becoming more, more formalized. And she was the regent to her son, Tutmosis III, and then she took the throne herself, got tired, wait, tired of, you know, Junior waiting to grow up, and she was kind of, you know, overseeing it. And people come to her, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? She's not going to ask her son. It's like, I'm in charge. Let me, I need to just take the crown and go from there. And it was a very successful culture. And this is her mortuary tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Very unusual. So large. That's one thing. And the stairway kind of represents her, I believe it's, it's part of her understanding that you need to go through steps in life to achieve. You don't start at the top. And a lot of the pyramids that we see, pyre, which means fire, or funeral pyre, pyramid, those pyramids were basically set up, and there's different interpretations, so I'm not trying to you know, give you the last word on it, but basically uh, stairways to heaven, or stairways to the sun. And those pyramids started to be built about 2500 BC, so at that point the goddess culture had pretty much ended, and the men decided that uh, they were going to take charge. And now I just want to give you a, a couple of fashion statements. Uh, Egyptian scarabs, which was a sign of a, a beetle who uh, was similar to a, a caterpillar who would go into, uh, would lay eggs in a dumb ball, which was round, and then from that dumb ball, the baby scarabs would then hatch. So again, it became a symbol of resurrection. You take the excrement, and we do this with fertilizer today, or with people that do composting. You're taking things that are dead, gone, not usable, putting in the ground, and they provide the nutrients for life. So, so the Egyptians were very much uh, attuned to this. And um, France, okay, became the height of fashion after Napoleon Bonaparte took an exposition into Egypt in the late 1700s. This is another one using that same motif. These are very expensive jeweled uh, necklaces. And we see the Egyptian influence, and these would cost thousands and maybe even more, depending on uh, who is the, uh, the seller. And here we have a little image of the goddess motif back to Isis. She has her son uh, on her lap who she's nurturing and feeding. Then we have after, this is sort of the uh, Byzantine or uh, Eastern Europe uh, iconography of Mary and Jesus. As you see, a little more primitive, also because it was in the desert climate, the skin tone is dark. Who, who knows that? We won't get into all the racial things, but I just think that uh, evolution and climate on the planet, I mean, you see darker people than the closer you get to the equator and the further away they're lighter. And uh, then we have, of course, on the left, the Virgin Mary, who uh, is in this sort of the classic pose, what we expect, wearing the blue veil and having Jesus, uh, her young son, on her lap. 
But the similarities are just pretty amazing. Now we'll go to Greece, 4th century BC. So that comes out to about uh, 300, the 300s, you know, we kind of round off the, the centuries. And the Greeks in this image are striking a fallen Amazon. And you got to say, Amazon? See, today, most kids, they hear Amazon. Oh, you mean Amazon.com? I like the way that Jeff Bezos has kind of taken a name, a feminine principle, and kind of abscounded it. So now, whenever you say Amazon, you don't think Amazons. Women, you think oh, products, where I get things cheap, where I can, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. He would pick such a powerful image as that. And I think that's why it's so recognizable. Now this is the opposite. This is an Amazon striking the fallen Greek soldier. Okay, and of course some pieces are always missing. You know, some of that sculpture doesn't hold up over time. Um, but one of the ways to identify uh, some of this is you see the Amazon on the left with the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, made it, I misspoke on earlier. The Amazon is on the left striking the, the fallen Greek. So you can see her breast protruding from her uh, uh, breastplate armor there. And uh, it may look like that's a breast there, but when you see the difference between that and that, you know that that is not that. <laughs> I think you can see that, right? <laughs> okay. So this, uh, now we have a, an artist named Franz von Stuck, who was uh, in the 19th century, and he's, he was somehow, I guess, fascinated with the mythology and with the iconography, and uh, this, this could be an imaginary battle, of course, because we sure haven't unearthed any centaurs. But at the same time, it's sort of, this is the time of the horse. The horse, uh, I found out, was not domesticated and used uh, really to probably around maybe the, uh, I'd say about the first, between the first and second millennium BC. That's approximately 2000 uh, BC and moving forward, you know, a few centuries. So is this a battle with the horses or is this a battle between men and women? But obviously you see the Amazon is, has a helmet, she's armed with a spear, She's riding bareback, and he's carrying a stone, and she's got a weapon. So who's more advanced in this situation? <laughs> and this same gentleman, I, I, I got a kick. He had so many images. I was like, how oh, come I haven't heard about this guy before? I just discovered him preparing for this talk. And he, he's showing one of the classic situations where you have the, the testosterone on the left at work, and the woman's kind of, you know, it's like, is she... Uh, waiting to see who's going to be the victor? I mean, obviously. But, you know, it's but so calm as if, you know, when you watch the nature shows and you see uh, <laughs> lions, for example, uh, you have the male lion and there's like maybe five lionesses and each time a male approaches, what happens? The main head, he goes to fight him off. Get out of here. This, this is mine. This is, you know, and I think somewhere along the line, depending on your observations in nature, men started saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, the lioness does all the hunting. Yes, the lioness takes care of all the, the cubs. And I don't hunt. What I just do is I just sleep all day, and when she's done killing, I come over and say, okay, I eat first. But male lions don't hunt. I was flabbergasted. But they do protect, even though they don't get the food. If anyone tries to, uh, whether it's an interloper or someone who wants to attack uh, the, the, uh, the pride, which is called, in another interesting name, a pride of lions, is a family of lions. One male and numerous females. He will perform his duty, which is to protect. Okay, now we have a goddess named Pallas Athena. And this uh, statue was found in uh, an ancient part of one of the complexes called Herculeum where the name Hercules basically comes from in Greece. And she is the only goddess who was born full grown from her father Zeus's head after he had his head split open to relieve a headache is the way the myth goes. <laughs> now think about that for a second. This is almost a form of immaculate conception. We have a woman coming out of a man's head, her father's head, so it seems that the goddess principle has been completely omitted. She's no longer giving birth. 
This goddess is a protector. This is a goddess of war. Now, until this time, if you remember from uh, Maria Gumbuta, she would say, when woman rule, there's peace. And I'm sure we all know women politicians and women today who have engaged in war or were forced to engage in war or as a protective instinct to certainly uh, stand up for their families and fight. But this myth, you know, the Greeks sort of had these myths and I started realizing due to uh, research I did reading Robert Graves, the uh, English poet and writer, that he said if the whole, the whole summary of Greek myths is basically moving from a matriarchal culture, that's the ones ruled by women, it's not that men are excluded, but they're there, going to a patriarchal culture. And if you notice in a lot of the religious literature of Christianity, you'll see the patriarchs. The patriarchs this, the patriarchs said that, the patriarchs did this. And the women play a, a secondary position. Now this is uh, a modern artist named Gustav Klimt. Uh, he's more famous for a, uh, a painting called The Kiss, with the golden jeweled wrapped woman with colorful, but when I found this, I said, holy mackerel. And he gives a very impassive, contrary to what we might think about femininity, you look at that face and that's almost like a statue. Okay, now we move to India. We have Kali, the ten-armed goddess of India who represents death and rebirth and the limits to which humanity dares to go beyond. Now, I'm sure we've seen symbols of this. Uh, I got a kick out of this. This reminded me of the Beatles had a movie called Help. Uh, it was their second major movie, and of course, the Beatles had screaming women chasing after them all the time. And I don't know how much you can see here, but if you look very carefully, when you, next time you see images like this, and you look, at, look behind Colin, you have a bunch of women all screaming and crowding. And who's underneath their feet? That's a guy. <laughs> okay. Now he apparently exceeded his limits. Now she is a goddess. And we have much in Greek tragedy, we have much in Shakespeare's tragedy of the pride of people going beyond their human limitations. <coughs> Tower of Babel is another story. Except in Egyptian culture, uh, I'm sorry, in, in Indian culture, we have a very fearsome goddess who holds a man's head, but she holds many symbols. This could be used for farming. Fire to keep you warm. Circle of life. This could be her, her, her um, scepter, so to speak. And when necessary, a sword. And she was a patron saint of priestesses. Now we get into the priestesses, who I have not mentioned. There were temples set up specifically for women to carry out what were called the women's mysteries and keep men out. Because somewhere along the line it was decided, okay, there's different ways of looking at things and doing things. And if we, if men can exclude us in their hunting groups or different rituals that they have, we're going to set up our rituals. And I think uniting the, the, the house in other words, a lot of men didn't so much need the temples until a little bit later. So again, Robert Graves in the Greek myths would say that the men took over the temples. Now this I just wanted to bring in because uh, I thought back to Amazons and I found this photograph of Dohemi African female warriors from the 19th century. And they've got rifles and guns and weapons and who would have thought? So certainly the, the African culture was not uh, excluded from these different developments. Now we're going to get to some art collectors. Louisine Havemeyer, 1855 to 1929. She was the wife of the sugar king, Henry O. Havemeyer. This is when the age of monopolies, in the turn of the century. Uh, she donated 3,000 works of art to the Met Museum, collecting the work of Mary Cassatt, and introduced her, meaning Havemeyer, personally to Pablo Picasso, Edouard Manet, Claude Monet, Edgar Degas, and other Impressionist artists. And their collection is extensive. And this is sort of where uh, they focus on modern. A lot of these women collectors started out focusing on modern art. 
Here we have a picture of Louise and Hammermeyer, who was also a suffragette supporter, having the 